Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today. We're going to be talking about secure coding in Go and uh, avoiding common vulnerabilities with my overly verbose title. Um, so one of the first and most important things in my, in my opinion is uh, having a secure mindset and habits when building when coding in general. And the best way to do that is to start with knowledge first. If you can identify code that may be vulnerable, then you know how to fix it and then uh, move on from there. And that'll help the team in general through code review processes um, to, to better secure your code base. Um, and then practice, you know, like looking for, uh, you know, ways that that software can be vulnerable and then, and then building a good set of test suites or fuzz, fuzz testing like uh, Katie talked about yesterday um, can really help uh, identify vulnerabilities in your application. Uh, the first and most important rule of application security is you don't trust user input. And uh, just for everybody in the back, you don't trust user input. Um, so what is user input? Uh, today, we're going to be talking about primarily uh, HTTP REST endpoints. Um, so for user input for those, it's uh, URL values, query values, headers, cookies, files, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I built this really awesome, vulnerable application. Don't ever use it in any of your code. It is very vulnerable. Um, there's the URL for it. If you guys want to see it, it's on GitHub. Um, we're going to go through some demos with this, uh, and I'm going to show uh, a number of different vulnerabilities, um, starting with injections. And this is a very busy slide. We're going to be talking about the things on top of it. Uh, so URL and query, URL query and header injections, SQL injection primarily, and uh, some command injection. Um, I'll briefly touch on uh, uh, cross-site scripting, which is the XSS. And um, not really going to talk about un unsafe redirects, but um, these are a lot of the injections that are common in, in applications. Um, the application right now uh, has iterable user IDs. I did this on purpose um, just because it, it, in and of itself, it's not a vulnerability, but it can lead to uh, an attacker being able to exploit an application. And the reason being is because when an attacker actually like, approaches an application, they're gonna do uh, a certain amount of evaluation to try and see what they can or cannot get easily from that application um, by enumerating different types of data. In this example, uh, the application is, uh, has an integer ID and is enumerable. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show an example of this. Um, and let me show you the iterator. So here's the code on the left. And on the right, you can see that I was able to iterate all of the users and all of their images uh, with, a, with a simple loop and bash uh, and a couple of curl calls. Um, you know, this shows every single user in the system. And um, oh, there we go. Um, and their IDs. Uh, now, you'll notice some interesting, some interesting things here. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. You can see that there's a password field and a role field, and they're empty on everybody. That's going to be important once we get a little bit further. Um, so uh, the best recommendation for this is uh, using a universally unique identifier. Uh, the, the, Go the Google package is fantastic for this. You don't have to use that, but use one. Um, the, the point behind uh, using a universally unique identifier is that you um, have a very, very low likelihood of collisions. Um, meaning that you uh, will not have the same ID probably in your lifetime um, across all of your devices, and it allows for uh, you to protect your system from being having innumerable IDs uh, so that somebody can't, you know, dump out the data. All right, so we're going to talk about URL header and query injection first, um, and I'm going to use the application that I have here and my cheat slide. Um, so uh, the, the primary uh, things we're going to be looking at are SQL injection, First, and the, at the bottom of the slide here, you can see on the left is the, um, the most common <laughs> SQL injection that you will ever see. This is what attackers will use to um, determine whether or not your application is vulnerable to SQL injection. But when they put it into your application, they're gonna use what's on the right, which is a URL encoded version of what's on the left. Um, so what we're gonna do first here is uh, I'm going to steal from my curl list, and we're going to uh, look at our user, which, um, this URL, or sorry, this, this code here on the left has a SQL uh, injection in it. Um, who, is, who has seen a SQL injection in Go before? Oh, this is great. All right, see if you can find the SQL injection on the left. I'm going to go ahead and execute the query on the right to dump out my user data. So this is my attacker, bad gopher, um, and uh, he is not a very nice person. There's only 10 users in this database. Um, whoop. Helps if I use the right commands. All right, we're gonna we're gonna probe the user 
and see if it's vulnerable to SQL injection. And what I'm doing here is I'm passing in that URL encoded ID, or sorry, the, the query injection string. So what you'll notice here is that I got a user back with a different ID and a different name, and it's the first user in the database, and I can make some assumptions about that from a SQL injection perspective. Most SQL databases will return the first record if you uh, change the query to where it looks like, no, I took the log out. Um, but essentially what it is is, you know, we're, we're bypassing the where statement um, by adding this or one equals one because one is always equal to one, and then the double dash at the end actually creates a comma or comment in SQLite, which is what the database is on the back end here. All right, so we know that we're vulnerable to SQL injection. Um, I'm going to look for friends um, because I like having friends, and uh, our attacker has no friends, right, which is a problem. So let's find out if we can make some more friends. Um, so we're going to see, now that we know that Gopher1 has friends, let's see if we can make all of the friends. Um, they don't have to be our friends. We want them as friends. Um, and they don't get a choice. So what we're going to do is we are going to do a union select, uh, which it looks like this here. Um, let's see here. Shift B. All right. So that's a union select. If you can't read it, I'm sorry. Um, but essentially what it does is it, uh, it I'm, I'm making some assumptions about the, the query on the back end, and then I'm bypassing the where filter, and I'm union selecting on the user's table and attempting to or expose more data. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this. And that's a lot of users. Now, if we go back to what I was saying earlier, there's some really interesting data in this, this return. Uh, not only was I able to um, dump out the entire user table, I now have access to passwords. Um, we'll talk about these passwords and, and what's uh, important about these passwords later on, but it is important to uh, understand that here, this query is actually not the one on the left. Who was able to find the SQL injection, by the way? Yeah? Okay. Let's talk about that real quick. So the SQL injection here is actually the fact that I'm using a fumpt sprintf inside of my query. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with the database SQL package in the Go standard library, um, you should definitely check it out. Who, who knows what a variadic argument is in Go? Okay, good. All right, so a variadic argument, for those who don't know, is an argument where uh, you can have, this is the dot, it's the dot, dot, dot. So you can have zero to n, theoretically, uh, arguments here at the end of the function uh, going into this SQL query. And the reason this is a uh, SQL injection is actually because the query is being constructed outside of the database SQL package. So this fumpt sprintf is allowing me to create a valid SQL query, but I'm bypassing the protections of the database SQL driver underneath for SQLite by composing it myself in, a, in an sprint statement. So to fix this, um, I can take off the sprintf and then correct the actual query string here with a question mark, which is what this should look like. Um, now, real quick here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, rebuild so that you can see that this actually did fix it. And there's a lot of commands in there. All right. So now we're going to rerun the original user query. So uh, here is the original user query. You can see that I'm a bad gopher. Um, and then you can run the second one, which is the injection. And you can see that I get no more data from this because I've corrected the SQL injection by leveraging the actual uh, driver underlying the SQL data, the, the, the standard library calls here, correctly using the variadic function. All right, so let me jump over to friends. All right, so friends is interesting because um, while there is, yes, a, a query injection, who, who built the database layer of their application? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so in most cases, when you step into an organization where there's an existing code base, the data access layer is, is generally abstracted away from most people. So this is probably what you're going to see, something very similar to this. Um, and my goal here was to actually make this look like normal code you might see in your code base. So this specifically is a SQL injection, which you know from the last example. But what you, what, what's more interesting and more telling about this is that I'm using a generic to map an object using a struct scan and a select star, which is then exposing more data from that user than, realistic, whoop, than really should be exposed. And you can see that here. Doo, 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 that there. So you can see that here. 
in the fact that my password is now visible, right? So uh, because I'm struct scanning and I'm mapping it to the user object, I'm not reducing the actual amount of data that's leaving my API and causing a potential problem. Um, now, I mean, with REST endpoints, you end up generally over-returning or under-returning data. You can also do some stuff with it like this with GraphQL. But what's really important to know about vulnerabilities in general, go or not, is that um, the fact that I'm using a REST endpoint here to illustrate this, or the fact that I'm using SQL, or the fact that I uh, have purposeful vulnerabilities in here doesn't actually change the fact that you could do this exact same thing through a CLI, you could do it through gRPC, you could do it through a message queue. A lot of these vulnerabilities can, can span multiple services. Um, and uh, so it's important to look out for this stuff. Um, but if I scroll down a little bit here, you can see where the actual struct scan happens. So uh, I'm, I'm using a third-party library here, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. And uh, that third-party library is reading those results into that uh, T value and returning it out just straight. Um, interestingly enough, while I was building this app, I found out that I could actually denial of service my system. Who wants to see me denial of service my system? Yeah? Cool, here we go. All right, so it's the exact same data with one difference. I am adding a semicolon. Oh, I guess I, technically it's two differences because I'm adding uh, the actual ID, but that doesn't really matter. All right, so notice I'm not getting any data, and let's take a look at my activity monitor. So this is really hard to see, but what, what I'm trying to illustrate here is you can actually watch my memory jump in that bottom left. Right now I'm sitting at three gigs. Oh, there's four gigs. And this will continue going up. Uh, and then, so this is actually a bug <laughs> in that third-party SQL driver um, that could expose a, uh, uh, an application to a denial of service. Um, really interesting because that was not my intention. All right. Um, I, and, oh, and actually here's an interesting thing. I canceled the call here. Who thinks it's still turned like denial of servicing my laptop? It is, yeah. Let's see if the memory. Let's see where the memory's at now. Oh, I can't even pull up the. Hold up. Activity monitor. Oh, yep. Yeah. See, it's still going. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close that down real quick. And um, let's see. I've got 32 minutes. Yeah, we're good. All right, so go run dot. I figured the the uh, demos are a little bit more fun. Okay, so uh, we're gonna run through, uh, oh, hey, actually, you know what? I, I should go back to my slides because um, that tells you where we're going next. All right, oh, I'm gonna show you a login bypass. Uh, that's a lot of fun. This happens a lot with SQL injections. Um, it's the same code, uh, well, kind of. Uh, the, the login bypass is actually a little easier. Um, let's show a valid login real quick. Um, I am going to log in with uh, user one here, uh, whose password is Hello Kitty Club 22 and uh, we will go ahead and we see, we see that the user's uh, information is returned back. I don't know why it's returning the password. I probably messed something up. Don't use this application, it's really vulnerable. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and then try a bad password, make sure that we can't, can't actually authenticate as another user with a bad password. And we're getting a 500, perfect. Oh, really important note here. Uh, when you're dealing with authentic authentication and authorization, which I'll touch on later, don't ever return a status code other than 500. Like, I don't care what the error is. If you return something other than 500, it gives an attacker information about your login system and authentication. Uh, and then theoretically, you should also have like a set amount of time that you always return the value and that doesn't matter. Easy things first. All right, so let's see if we can log pass, bypass the login for user one. You notice that the, uh, the command here says, doesn't matter for password. And that's because we're passing a single quote with a double dash right after the email address. Now, this doesn't always work. I had to manufacture this, but now I'm logged in as user one. And the reason this, this doesn't always work is because this ex expects that your where statement's all on the same line, but it can still happen, right? So I just logged in as user one. I got a successful login without actually ever using a password. I'm now authenticated and escalated my privilege up to go for prime. All right, so let's go back to my presentation. All right, this is gonna be a fun one. I like this, cool. this is a cool one. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about unsafe file upload and path traversal. Who knows what a path traversal is? Sweet, all right. 
Patch reversal is uh, injecting data into uh, somewhere in the HTTP call. We're going to use headers because that's fun. Um, and it allows you to move around the directory of the server in different and unique ways. So, oh, don't go forward. There we go. All right. And do what I say. All right, here we go. First, I'm going to show you a list of images. So these are the, all the, by the way, the database for this is actually in the Git repository. You should be able to run all of these things straight from there. There's a curl.txt file or a postman file, whichever you prefer. All right, so this is an images call. I wanted to be able to list the images for a user. Uh, this is an interesting one though, because um, I purposefully did what's known as a command injection here. Let me go back up. Um, by using the ls command to actually list my, my images. Now, this is really bad practice. Um, you should probably just use the standard library. Uh, if you don't use the standard library a lot, you should use it more often. Um, it protects you from things like this, uh, especially when you're doing like a file server. But bad practice. Um, I haven't actually seen a command injection in the wild uh, in Go. Uh, more of a Java thing. All right, so um, now that I know that we can uh, show the images, let's look at see if we can uh, do a path traversal. So what I did here is um, I used uh, the header, and instead of putting a user ID in, I did a dot dot slash to move into the parent directory. Now, because I did that, I was able to dump out my files here, which is great, you know, like um, being able to see everything running on the server. Let's see if we can access more than just the actual application directory. So here, I'm putting in the directory for my SSH file, okay? And that's weird. Um, those look like keys. So I'm not gonna open up my keys for everybody here since it's being recorded, because that would be stupid. But what you'll notice is I don't have an authorized keys file in here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an unsafe file upload, um, but we're, first I'm gonna show you that the upload actually works. Yeah, here we go. All right, so we're gonna upload my go for me to user 10. Uh, it's the same one that I use in uh, Discord. And I got a 200, which shows that I was able to upload the file. And if I uh, do a get status, you can see the file there under your image. Images user 10. Because I'm hosting this from the file system, right? All right, so now we know that we can upload a file. That's cool. Um, let's see if we can upload a file to a different directory. Now, I tried this in my practice session. And uh, it does work, but I don't actually know where it's going, to be fair, with the dot dot slash here. Um, it actually might be the one that's actually in this directory. I'm just overwriting it because I'm using it as the example. But more importantly, I can then use this curl command, which you'll notice uses, instead of the go for me file, it uses an authorized keys file, which is not great because now uh, if I cat the authorized keys file in my SSH directory, I now have a bad key in here and somebody can remote into my system, which is not fun. All right, so let's remove that real quick, just because I don't want to jack up SSH. All right, um, that's kind of it for the demo. Let's talk about some more slides. Um, all right, so normally I would ask for questions because I run the meetup in Raleigh, but like, this is different. Uh, so let's talk about stored and reflected SSS, XSS. Uh, XSS is cross-site scripting. Um, cross-site scripting is nasty. Uh, it is um, primarily caused by taking user input that is JavaScript and rendering it to the user. So again, back to rule one, we do not trust user input. Uh, when the data comes into your system, whether it's for um, going into a database, whether it's going into back to the user, whether, however you're, you're representing that data, it should be encoded on the way to that system. If it's going to the database, properly encoded for SQL, or SQL, or you know, NoSQL, or whatever you're using as your database. Um, reflected XSS, uh, if, it's, if you, if you um, are gonna be representing it back to a user, properly use the Go standard library HTML template, or sorry, the Go HTML template in the standard library, and do not cast it as safe HTML. Um, pass it in as a value, they'll properly encode it for you, the Go team has your back. All right, um, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in the app. If you pull it down, uh, have fun. I left some, uh, you know, um, 
I don't remember the word. I left some fun stuff in there. You guys should go. I'll find it. Um, there's lots more vulnerabilities than what I'm actually showing you, but I'm gonna. I'm, you know, I've got only 25 minutes left here. Let's talk about cryptography, though. Um, so there was awesome, an awesome talk just recent, like just right before mine, about cryptography and like safe random numbers. Um, who knows the difference between encoding and encrypting? All right, this is a common misunderstanding. Encoding is uh, changing data from one form to another. It provides absolutely zero security to the data that's actually in that. Uh, I'll use base64 encoding because everybody's gonna be familiar with it. While it's used in conjunction a lot of the time with encryption, the purpose of base64 encoding is to convert it to an alphanumeric form that is easy to store and doesn't cause null byte problems and stuff like that. But it doesn't actually in, uh, secure the actual data. It's, you, can, you, can decrypt, you can decode it, excuse me, decode it without any information. It's a, it's a standard, standard thing. Encryption is actually protecting the clear text data by, create, by obfuscating the data as a ciphertext. Um, there are two primary methods for encrypting data. Um, there is asymmetric encryption and symmetric encryption, and you use both of them every day. Asymmetric encryption um, is a public and private key encryption. So you would normally see this with like an SSH key. You have a public key and you have a private key and you give GitHub your public key, not your private key. And then you're able to push information up to GitHub. Um, symmetric encryption is where you have a shared key. The one single key encrypts the data. And then uh, you have to have the same key to decrypt the data. Um, so this is the face palm gopher. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, this is, so if you haven't heard about electronic code book, this is a really cool example. Um, and, uh, Filippo had an awesome blog on how to generate this. So I was able to do it. Um, normally you would see somebody show this with the Linux penguin, but this is GopherCon. This is an ECB encrypted gopher, which as you can see is perfectly safe. There is nothing here to be concerned about from an encryption standpoint at all. Right? Good. All right. So obviously I'm being sarcastic. Um, how electronic code work works from my limited understanding is that it breaks it up into chunks of bytes and encrypts those. And then because of this specific image format, it allows you to see the data because it represents it as colors, which is cool. This is a properly encrypted gopher, um, which obviously is actually protected. Um, if you haven't checked that out before, check the speaker notes for the presentation, which I'll link in uh, Discord. Um, I actually have a link to uh, the blog where I got the, the comments or the uh, commands and everything. Um, what should you encrypt? We have disk encryption, transport encryption, and field encryption. And um, the answer is yes. Um, now, it's, it's important to understand, though, the risk profiles of each of these. So disk encryption protects you from somebody walking into your AWS, I don't know, wherever AWS is, and pulling a drive out of the server and, and somehow being able to access that data unencrypted. Transport encryption, we use every day, TLS. You should always use TLS. If you're not using TLS, good thing you're here. Um, field level encryption is one that's not done often enough. Um, who, had, who was part of a data breach this last year? I don't see any hands. You guys don't know? Um, anyways, yeah, I mean, we got like Verizon and, uh, Twitter and oh, there's like, I don't know, 260 of them or uh, more, more than that. Um, anyways, field level encryption protects your users when you encrypt their data into the actual database, so like field level encryption in the database. What does this protect? This protects you if somebody gets access to the system your database is running on and they steal your database. It still doesn't protect you from any of the vulnerabilities I showed you earlier, right? Um, because the vulnerabilities I showed you earlier are going through the REST endpoint, which automatically would decrypt the data as it's passed back to the user. But if you're not doing field level encryption, you should be. Um, that was a big deal in the Equifax breach. That's how a bunch of our awesome PII data got, uh, you know, stolen by hackers. So it's a wonderful day. Transport encryption is uh, super important enough for me to have a slide. If you're not familiar with the uh, uh, TLS handshake, that's what's on the right. Um, there's a lot of arrows back and forth. But essentially what happens is the client says hello, um, and then the server responds with a certificate. So this is public key, public key at first. Uh, so it returns, returns the public key. The client verifies that public key with a, a certificate authority that, or a cert certificate that's installed on the box. 
And then uh, there's a key exchange where they exchange a symmetric key um, that's then used for uh, encryption and decryption, and that uh, persists through the rest of the communication. Um, don't ignore TLS errors. I saw a recommendation in a library recently where um, if it breaks because of TLS errors to ignore them. Um, if you do this, an attacker can man in the middle of your application. You should never ignore TLS errors. Uh, if you work for an enterprise, shame on you, they should be able to pay for certificates or get them for free from Let's Encrypt. Uh, I got 19 minutes. Wow, I'm actually doing pretty good. Um, all right, so let's talk about auth. Authentication and authorization, which I uh, combined on the same slide and made them shorter. Um, you'll see them like this online, but it doesn't really tell you what they are. So authentication is the, um, the who are you, and authorization is what can you do. So uh, if you are not a security expert, do not build your own authentication. Also, don't build your own authorization. If you work for an enterprise, go pay somebody else that's good at it, like Auth0. Um, because then they get hacked and there's a problem, they know how to fix it. Um, follow best practices. I'm gonna have a link in here, or uh, a slide where I actually recommend some places to look if you're looking for best practices. Um, but in all seriousness though, uh, if you are bad at these things, that is probably the easiest way to make your application insecure. Um, you know, sign JWTs, uh, set up middleware API handlers to handle the authentication and authorization so that a, a new engineer on the team can't accidentally bypass those. Um, you know, uh, set up role-based um, access controls or attributes-based access controls. Um, oh, yeah, so password storage is one I'm gonna touch on um, specifically. Who knows the difference between crypt, crypt, uh, hashing and encryption? Cool. All right, hashing is a one-way function. Uh, cryptographic hashing is not just a one-way function. Um, it is also collision-resistant, computationally intensive, and like other hashes, not predictable. Um, it's really important to use cryptographic hashes when handling passwords. You should never encrypt a password. If you're encrypting passwords and you're not one password, or well, don't not LastPass, they got breached too. Um, if you're one password or one of the other password managers, uh, I don't know, maybe Bitwarden or somebody who hasn't been breached, um, you should never be encrypting passwords. Always hashing, always hashing. You can, you can verify that a user is who they say they are by passing them through the hash. The, uh, and then the other thing is make sure you salt the hash with a sufficiently random or cryptographically random, ideally, uh, value. If you pull down the application, I have a really cool test for this. Um, so uh, best practice, which I, I honestly did not know until this last week while I was doing the research for my presentation, is now to use argon to id uh, salted, which I would have told you anyways. Um, and then argon actually takes a minimum number of amount, minimum, minimum amount of memory. On the left, I pulled the top 1,000 passwords from online, they're really easy to find. Um, SHA-256 them and Argon2ID them in the Go app, the vulnerable one. It's in a test. If you run that, it'll actually give you the results. It's gonna be different on every machine, right? I'm running on an Air. You know, somebody who has a new, a new MacBook Pro probably won't have that problem. Um, but what's cool about this is that it actually shows how uh, industry standard, which used to be SHA-256, can hash all 1,000 passwords in a millisecond, and Argon2ID, um, because they're intended, like these cryptographic hashes should be computationally expensive, um, takes 27 seconds to do the, to the, do the total thousand, which is great. I know it uses more processing and uh, memory and all those things, but it's actually really important from, a, from a, uh, a hashing perspective that it does this so that people can't brute force your passwords or uh, create rainbow tables easily. Um, this is something you don't wanna, uh, don't wanna mess up. So look for best practices from uh, OWASP is a good, a good resource. Um, ask your security team if you're part of an enterprise, if you have a security team, ask them. Um, if you're dealing with TLS, uh, TLS 1.3, the Go, kinda, Go team takes it out of your hands. They, they make sure that it's the correct um, algorithms and everything. Uh, if you're not using 1.3, you should be, but um, if you have to still handle legacy applications, SSL Labs is a great um, resource for which algorithms and hashing methods to use for like one in, or 1 or 1.1 and 1.2. Um, but look for author, uh, authoritative sources. The Go, security, the Go security team has your back. OWASP, which is um, a really long name and a stupid acronym, but it's there. Um, if you look it up like that, you'll find them. And then NIST. NIST has okay stuff. All right. Let's talk about supply chain. Um, 
I wasn't originally going to include this, but it was actually recommended by another security friend of mine. Um, the, it, there's a couple of interesting things about this, and there's a lot of really like famous attacks on here. Who was affected by solar winds? Oh, that's good. All right, I didn't see any hands. Um, what about the code cuff breach? Yeah, who had their keys stolen? Oh, I did. All right, um, has anybody ever used Node? Hopefully not. Okay, well then you don't know what event stream and left patent faker are probably. Um, but essentially uh, what happened is, and I'll, I'll use uh, left pad as a good example. So left pad happened while I was still at, uh, at Semantic. Um, somebody decided to delete their NPM module or something like that. I don't remember, I'm not a Node developer. And, uh, and then it broke everything, like the whole internet. Uh, it was like three lines of code and it just added like an extra padding for tabs or something. Really cool, actually. Um, and then somebody did it with Faker last year um, and another library where they like corrupted the actual package and caused problems for a lot of people in the Node community. <laughs> um, not trying to make light of it, but it is actually something, it's, it's really important to actually uh, take these uh, for, the Go, for the Go community and actually um, learn from them. So um, this, is, this is a big one. And um, I, I forget his name, but he, from CrowdStrike that talked earlier about dependency stuff, this is actually hitting exactly on what he said. Um, if you're using third-party libraries and you have not reviewed those third-party libraries, shame on you. Um, go code review your third-party libraries, right? Lint them with your linting, use the go test all, test them with their tests, look at how much code coverage they have, like evaluate those libraries as if you were evaluating your own code. Um, that is the single easiest way to end up with a vulnerability in your code is to use a library that is not well maintained, not well written, or uh, is not built from a security perspective. Um, it is also, uh, because it's compiled into your binary, you have to recompile it when, you're, when you have to go fix it, right? Like you have to redeploy applications and stuff like that. Um, don't let this happen to you. It's not fun. Um, the, uh, you know, linting helps a lot. Actually, there's some really cool linters in the Go community. Um, you know, uh, um, source code scanning doesn't find everything, but it's better than nothing. And uh, GoSec is awesome. Static check is cool. I um, have learned stuff from those that I didn't know before. Um, you know, use the linters. That's it's part of the tools that we have. Um, you know, don't don't be a statistic here. Uh, the one that I'm going to hit on more importantly is actually, and and this is one that's like near and dear to me for some reason because I'm a nerd. But um, get impersonation and code signing. Who signs their code commits? Ah, oh, that's actually more than I expected. Wow. Well, Linus stopped by to say hi. Um, he wanted to let everybody know that GopherCon is awesome. Uh, he left his commit in my uh, demo app, actually. Um, here it is. Uh, you can tell that it's him because uh, it's not marked as verified or unverified. It's clearly Linus. Um, but uh, a lot of people um, misunderstand that Git in and of itself is not actually um, authenticated. So uh, just because you use an SSH key or uh, some form of authentication to submit your code up to like a GitHub or your Git server, whatever you're using for Git, it doesn't actually mean that that's attached to the code commit and included in the repository. And this is actually a really a uh, prime example of that. And Linus should know better because he wrote Git. But um, the, the, the tools that we have like GitHub and GitT and uh, GitLab all provide this, this very nice verified, unverified, security mechanism so that if you do sign your code commits, you can put your public key, not your private key, into their system, and it will show you whether or not it was correctly signed. Um, the bottom one is me, I always sign my code commits, the, and then obviously Linus, and then the top one is me purposely uh, going around my code signing um, settings in Git um, to show what it looks like when somebody, if somebody were to try and impersonate me in Git, this is what you're gonna see. So if you see things like this where somebody does sign their code and says unverified, you probably should uh, not merge that PR. And the cool thing is, is a lot of these vendors like GitHub and all them, they actually have branch protections in place that allow you to verify that code is signed. It can be kind of a pain in the ass to start, like to set up, but like for the most part, you know, uh, it's something where it protects you and your team because it creates this cryptographically signed uh, record of, of code. It also lets you identify whether or not somebody had, it, had their account taken over. All right, well, I got like 10 minutes. Um, so to recap, 
common vulnerabilities. So the many injectionables, um, while the ability to inject into like headers and URLs and queries and things like that is not in and of itself a vulnerability, it does expose vulnerabilities uh, in your code. Um, fuzzing is fantastic for this. Um, you should definitely be using fuzzing. Katie gave an awesome talk yesterday on it. Go watch that talk. Um, cryptographic misconfiguration. Uh, this is the TLS. You know, if you're using TLS 1.3, the Go team has your back. If you're not using TLS 1.3 or you're using it alongside the other ones, go find the best practices for, for the actual algorithms, hashing algorithms, and uh, trust others, people in security who are cryptographers, not me, cryptographers, um, to tell you which algorithms are safe to use. Um, if you're authenticating or authorizing users, make sure that you are doing it correctly or pay somebody else to do it who does it really well. Um, vet your third-party libraries. The supply chain is vulnerable. And I'm not even just talking about, you know, Git and code signing, you know, check your CI CD pipelines. Are they verifying that the code that they're deploying has been properly uh, gone through the PR process or has passed linting tests or, or unit tests or things like that? Um, you know, who are your vendors in those situations? And you may not be on the DevOps side, but that's super important for supply chain too. But more importantly, knowledge is key. Be proactive, uh, you know, have a good mental model for like, is this secure? Build good habits. Because it's hard to go back and fix things later. As I'm sure everybody's aware, uh, as engineers, you know, it's feature, 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 not bug fix. So if you can make it secure in the get from the get-go, that's gonna be better for everybody. Um, uh, oh, the other thing is OWASP has a list of the top 10 vulnerabilities, actually. Um, they have, the, their website is actually, has a lot of information on it. The thing that security practitioners don't do a good job of is telling you how to fix it in your language um, and Go is kind of young. So, um, you know, there is a security channel in the, uh, the Go Slack. If you have questions, um, reach out to the Go team. I don't know. Uh, reach out to other community members for how to fix certain things in Go, and that'll be, that'll be your best bet for that. Um, anyways, that's my talk. Thanks for attending. There's all my social stuff. This is my current favorite library here. Um, if you guys want to check it out, if you've been hanging out with a swarm, you've heard me talk nonstop about this and they're probably getting sick of it by now, but this library is accidentally awesome. Um, and if you wanna know why, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, but that's it, that's it for me.